I'm here to read God's Word this morning. We're going to read from Matthew chapter 21. I'm uh, verses 1 through 11. I'm reading from the NIV. And the uh, heading in my Bible here is Jesus comes to Jerusalem as king. Matthew uh, 21 verses 1 through 11. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Beth Bethpage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, see, your king comes to you, gentle, riding on a donkey, and a colt of, a foal, of the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks upon them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowd that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Jesus, when Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowd answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. God had the reading, the blessing of his word. It has been uh, quite a week. I don't know if you get paper anymore, but imagine the headlines of some of the events of this week. The Mississippi, Arkansas, and last night, the Delaware tornado, uh, and there's some more coming possibly today. Um, of course, earlier in the week, the Tennessee shooting, and then the New York indictment. As I listen to stories, I was watching the basketball game last night, and the Philadelphia uh, station broke into the basketball game, which I was taping, and went and talked about tornadoes for about two hours. <laughs> and none ever stepped down there, they just talked about them for a while. But when I think about the shooting, when I think about the indictment, I think so many people are quick to run out and just talk. They're reacting, and I use the word reacting because they don't even know what they're talking about yet. There's so much yet to be known. Um, and actually, when I listen to them, I'm realizing I'm learning more about who they are than the actual event that they're talking about. Because they're just saying what they want to say, using any excuse to, to run their agenda by you. Now, after time, we can start to hear responses. Difference between a reaction and a response. How many of you know the difference in your own life between reacting and responding? You have some time, you calm down, you think more measuredly, you, you, you process and you think of what's the most accurate, what's the best thing that I can do in this situation. Instead of making it worse, how can I help it be better? Now, as I listen to people at the end of the week talk about the things they were talking about at the beginning of the week, one of the first things I heard about the shooting was, we have to harden our schools, we have to do more, those doors should be locked. The door was locked. They had no idea what they were talking about. At the end of the week, they had a little bit more of a measured response. The biases are still there. The biases are still there. Unfortunately, that New York indictment is probably going to be with us for about two years, from what I'm hearing, before it runs its way through the court. I am already sick of hearing about it. Because the people that have made up their mind, he's guilty. The people who have made up their mind, he's being persecuted. They're not going to change their minds. And we're just going to have to walk through. Well, as I think about all of that, trying to process that, I think about Palm Sunday. What would be the headline for Palm Sunday? How about this? Victory parade for the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. Is that accurate? 
and doesn't even begin to tell the story. Doesn't even begin. That's what a headline does. It just tries to draw you in. Uh, the idea of it. Why do I say a victory parade? Because they took their cloaks off and they laid them on the road. That was uh, a royal treatment for Jesus, treating him as a king. The word, the word victory, palm branches were a sign of victory, to be waved as a sign of victory, and also laid on the road as he rode along. The problem with that story is he's riding on a donkey. The world expects its conquering kings to come in on a horse in all great power. Jesus is coming again that way. But this time, it was humbly on the foal of a donkey, the colt of a donkey. Those who understood prophecy would recognize this is the Messiah. He is fulfilling Messianic prophecy. Zephaniah 9.9 is the, the verse that mentions that. There are a number of, of responses to the events of that day. And I think of how long I've known about Palm Sunday. I was a little kid. Yeah, I was little once. And, and they gave me a palm branch and I walked up and down the aisle. didn't know what I was doing. But I was cool, you know, I could, I could run around a church with a book raising, raising a branch. The responses of that day, what we learn from that day, there is much that we can. It's a familiar story, and sometimes the more familiar the story, the more we turn off. We have time to study this morning how the people responded. And my proposition this morning is there is much to learn from the responses to Jesus on Palm Sunday. And as we consider their responses at the end of this message, we can consider what our response should be. So let's bow in a word of prayer, and we'll look at the Matthew 21. We'll be in Matthew 21 for all but one part of the message this morning. Matthew 21, let's pray. Father, I thank you. I thank you for a little comedic look at what the disciples would have been going through as they were asked to do something to, to prepare for that day. As they were going along, we'll see in a moment. We thank you for the music. Thank you for Sam and just that beautiful a man who's walked with you for a long time. And he's still singing about wanting to hear more about the stories of Jesus. Amen. Help us to see that today. No matter how much we think we know the story, help us to consider it in a different light. And as we discern how the people of the day responded, let us judge and examine ourselves based on how we are responding to you. Father, I pray that you'll have mercy on me, a sinner, that nothing I am or say will hinder what your spirit wants to do in your word in our hearts today. It is in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. Amen. The first we're going to look at is the response of the disciples. Paul's already read it, but I'll read it again. Now, when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethphage, to the Mount of Olives, that Jesus then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you should say, The Lord needs him, and he, he will send them at once. I don't know if anybody stopped. I can't remember the other gospel references, whether somebody actually challenged them or not, but they had their orders. And the first thing I would say, the response of the disciples is trust. Trust. If you're going to be a disciple of Christ, you have to begin with trust. Faith, trusting in the Lord. They had been walking with Jesus for almost three years. Three years. They were being sent to the little village of Bethphage to find this cult. And they were given just one thing to say if there was a problem. They had to trust Jesus. Now, I have been to Israel, and ever since I've been there, I can't read passages like this anymore in the same way. The Mount of Olives is right next to the Temple Mount with the Kidron Valley in between. I didn't put a picture up there, but the Kidron Valley, and it's a big cemetery. A lot, of, a lot of dead bodies buried there. But that's what, at the bottom of the Mount of Olives on the Temple side is Gethsemane, and you go up the hill, and that's the Paul Sunny Road. The thing that struck me most when I was there was it's not a flat little surface that they're walking on. It is a steep decline down that hill. But they're on the other side. They're on the other side of the Mount of Olives. We didn't go there. I mean, we were at the top. We could look there, but we didn't go down. And, and they're coming up with other travelers for the feast. They're coming in. Passover's in a couple of days. They're coming and they're traveling together, and Jesus knows that something needs to happen, 
He needs to fulfill this prophecy, so he sends his disciples to do this. And whether they understood or not, they were supposed to do it. They went along and they did it. Trust. The second thing is obedience. Jump down to verse 6 and 7. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put on them their clothes, and he sat on them. How many times do we come to church and talk a lot about faith, talk a lot about obedience, but when we walk out the door, uh, I forgot everything and I'm doing whatever I want. They followed through. They followed through. They had trust to go on their way, and they did exactly what he asked them to do. They didn't just talk about trust. They lived it out, which reminds me of a great hymn, <laughs> Trust and Obey. Trust and obey. My question, each one of these responses, I'll ask us a question. Are we willing to trust and obey even when we don't fully understand? See, it's easy to trust. Well, when we can see it, no. Trust is about what we can't see. Faith is about what we can't see. We don't understand what Jesus is doing. But are we willing to trust and obey? I love the skit. He said, I don't know why he's asking us to get a donkey. I don't know why they're collecting branches over here. But I sense something big is about to happen. I read this week, uh, and I've heard this before, but that every day your mind creates 900 neurons for your brain. How are they being created? What direction are they being created? I've been told my anger is, is in my brain, it's a four lane highway with exit ramps and everything. I go, that, that's the default. That's the default that I go to when something bad happens. I've got to destroy that road and build new roads. That's the idea of it. And they're, they're studying this a lot. And then I think about, the, we, Scott and I joke about left and right brain. You know, left brains are important. We have to be precise in the things that we do. But the right brain, the music, the, 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 the subjective parts, so that we can hear what God might be saying to us. We need all of that. So every morning you wake up, you have a choice. How are you going to build those neurons? What are you going to focus on today that's going to help you renew your mind? Paul had it back in Romans 12. Renew your mind according to God's word. Let, the, let that new pathway that's being built today take you to a better place. Take you to where you are following and walking with Jesus. Something big might be happening that you're ready for. So that's the response of the disciples to, to follow what they did. We need to trust and obey even when we don't understand. The next response is the response of the prophets. The response of the prophets. Listen as I read verses 4 and 5. I skipped them earlier. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast, of burden. Zechariah 9.9 9 is what's being quoted there. So I thought about that verse and said, what do I want to say about the prophets? Do I even want to bother? Well, then I found 1 Peter 1. And I ask you to take your Bibles, if you would, and turn to 1 Peter 1. There are four verses there, three verses we're going to spend. 1 Peter 1, verses 10 through 12. And it talks about the Old Testament prophets. And I think we can learn from them uh, as we think about Palm Sunday today. Verse 10 of 1 Peter 1. Concerning this salvation, the Apostle Peter is writing, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. Now that would make no sense if I was on the other side of the cross. If it hadn't happened yet. I'd read a lot of words and i said, but what does that mean? But how beautifully it is when we see what Jesus has done. I don't know how well the prophets understood what they were prophesying. But the first thing I see, they have a desire to learn. They are looking and searching carefully what they can know about the coming Messiah. About the, about the God who's sending the coming Messiah. It talks about grace. How many of you have heard, oh, the Old Testament is about justice and judgment. There is so much grace in the Old Testament. Because in essence, before the cross, God could say, at any time, I could wipe you out because you're all sinners. But I'm giving, I've been reading through uh, 
Numbers and Leviticus and Exodus and all of to see all the different ways they were to bring offerings before the Lord. How precise it was. Today I read about the man that went out on the Sabbath and collected some sticks and they took him outside and stoned him. That seemed harsh. But everybody deserved to die. They were all in their sin in front of a holy God. But God was gracious and he showed them ways that they could appease his wrath in the midst of their sinfulness. So they see grace. The prophets see grace. Um, they also see a person, a person who is coming. Starting with the first prophecy, the seed of the woman will crush the serpent's head. That's the beginning of the prophecies of Jesus. And to know that they're looking at what this person would be. And the time. Do you know you read the book of Daniel and he talks about Daniel's 70 weeks of years? at 70, seven year periods. You can calculate when Jesus was to be presented on this day. This is the day that Jesus would be presented as king and he would be rejected. The Messiah will be cut off. And then there's a big time in between until that final week of years, which we call the tribulation, the, the day of, of Jacob's trouble. God has a prof prophetic. Now, we don't know when that's coming, but they could have calculated when Jesus would appear if they had had the ability to see it that clearly. So grace is person, the time, and then I love this. At the end of verse 11, indicating when he predicted what? The sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. You know, if you write a headline, you're trying to spin the story. The people of the day spun the prophecies of the Messiah to say, He is coming to deliver us from Rome. He is coming to set up a kingdom. They totally ignored the half of the prophecies that said, He's coming to die for us. He's coming to suffer for us. He's coming to be one of us. See, they spun it. They're they were spinning even back then, the story. So we see, Peter says, the prophet spoke of both the sufferings and the subsequent glories. It's just exciting to know that when you have a desire to learn, there is so much to learn. And we should learn like the prophets of old. They were guided by the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Christ. They were guided by them to, by them to, 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 know, to know what was going to happen, or at least prophesy some of the things that were going to happen. But then verse 12 really got my attention. In 1 Peter 1, it was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you, in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. I love that verse. These prophets knew that they were, they were serving a people yet to come. They weren't going to see what they were prophesying. Some of the things they did, some of the prophecies were near, but the far from them, they wouldn't see. But they knew they were called of God to share the truth of what was going to happen. They, in love, serving their Father, their Creator, they were serving us by writing down what was to happen. They were serving. So they not only had a desire to learn, they had a desire to serve. And not only do the prophets think about all the people that have since shared the good news of Jesus Christ. Those disciples that saw the resurrection, that saw the crucifixion, that saw all the things that Jesus, they shared the story, and it was shared again and again and again and again. Think about the person right now who told you about Jesus. Praise the Lord that we can have a desire to learn more about Jesus so we can serve him better so that others will be blessed. So my question regarding the response of the prophets are we led by the Spirit to learn and serve? And I say by the Spirit, because when we recruit things here at the church, there are times that we just want to get a job done. I pray that we don't just do it for that, that we remind ourselves, oh, we're serving the Lord. We're serving the Lord as we serve one another, as we serve this church, as we serve our missionaries, as we serve. We are serving the Lord. So are you led by the Spirit to learn about Him and to serve Him? Going on back to Matthew 21, verses 8 through 11. Verses 8 through 11. We're going to see the response of the crowd. The first two were really good examples that eh, it's going to start to fall apart now. 
the response of the crowd. Verses 8 through 9, most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that were, went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Do you know the word Hosanna means? Oh, say. Victory was the palm branch. Oh, Hosanna means oh, say. Oh, say. The response of the crowd was, we're seeking salvation from Jesus. That sounds good, doesn't it? They're seeking the wrong salvation because there's some things that they misunderstand. They're asking for saving. Save us from the wrongs. Jesus had another purpose, a more important, more important purpose. Look at verse 10. And when, they, when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up saying, who is this? And the crowd said, if I ask you, who is this? What would you say? This is what they said. This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. How many people today say, yeah, Jesus was a rabbi. He was a good teacher. Maybe beyond teacher, we would say prophet. He had some special inspiration as a prophet. He was so much more than a prophet. He was so much more than where he came from. You remember the disciple? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? The people in the south look down on the people from the north. Kind of sounds like America today. The north looking down on the south and south looking... You know, they, they had the same kind of things going on. So the people of Galilee, they're the hicks up there. You know, the Judeans were the, were the, were God, we're, we're closer to God. We're closer to the temple. But the fact is, they didn't get it right. They didn't nearly say enough. This is the prophet Jesus uh, from Nazareth of Galilee. And the reason they didn't get it right is because they misunderstood his person. They misunderstood his person. See, we can talk about the name of Jesus Christ. People use that name in ways they should never use that name. But we need to know what we're talking about, who we're talking about. Understand, he's so much more than everything you've ever been taught. I say it all the time. In heaven, I will have eternity to learn more about my God, creator, uh, my savior, Jesus, and the sustainer of the Holy Spirit. I'll have all of eternity to learn about God and I will never exhaust what there is to learn. Amen. That's how awesome he is. So we need to constantly be learning about who Jesus is, who he is in his person. They also misunderstood his purpose. As I said, they were looking for salvation from the Romans. They were trying to get those foreigners, those Gentiles, those dirty, mean soldiers out of our city. We want to rule ourselves. They never did that well. From the days of Joshua, from the days of Moses, they never did that well. And they just constantly turned from the Lord, and the Lord allowed them to be overtaken. Sometimes he delivered, sometimes he let them stay there for a while. Well, they misunderstood his person, they misunderstood his purpose, even though they were seeking a salvation from Jesus. Only the, God, the Son of God, his person, who was also the Son of Man, could bring man and God together heard that before. There's only one mediator, because there's only one God-man. Jesus was both Son of God and Son of Man. So my question for this response is, do we seek salvation from sin through the Son of God? We're going to have communion at the end of the service. And we're going to talk about not partaking of the elements in an unworthy manner. And for some religions, well, i got to go take do some penance before I'm going to be forgiven. Confess, and he is faithful and just to forgive. You are trusting in salvation for your sin through the Son of God. It is always through the Son of God. You're not invited to the communion table because you've had a good week, or you're promising to have a good week next week. You're invited because of the blood of Jesus and the grace that he bestows upon us. So do you seek salvation from sin, forgiveness from sin, through the Son of God? That's the only place to find it. Religion seeks its own way. And that's our last group. The response of the religious, you can also fit in their leaders. I couldn't fit it on the, uh, the uh, slide. The response of the religious leaders. Let's look at what they have to do. I'm going to read verses 12 through 17, and we'll talk about that. Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who sold and bought in the temple. 
And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. He said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you make it a den of robbers. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. Good thing it's not the Sabbath. But when the chief priests, from the religious people's standpoint, you know, but when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, well, that sounds good, that's promising, wonderful things, and the children crying out of the temple, Hosanna and the son of David, they were indignant. They were indignant. And they said to him, do you hear what these are saying? And Jesus said to them, yes. Have you never read out of the mouth of infants and nursing babies, you have prepared praise? And then leaving them, he went out of the city to Bethany and lodged there. On the other side of the Mount of Olives, about a two-mile walk, he spent the time with Mary and Martha and Lazarus that whole last week of his life here on earth. First thing I see about the response of the religious leaders, they really had messed up priorities. Wrong priorities. How many times did they walk by the money changers and the people selling animals, knowing that they were ripping people off? You had to exchange your money because you couldn't spend your normal money in the temple. You had to get the temple money. So you exchange it, and they rip people off on the exchange. You had to buy their approved sacrifices, the pigeons. I mean, we can find pigeons anywhere. No, no, you have to you have to buy them from us. And Jesus, Jesus saw it. One of the, one of the gospels says he made a whip. He didn't just fly off the handle. He planned it and he made a disruption because they were disrupting what was going on in the house of prayer. They were not making it possible. Now, they they accepted that. They accepted all the problems that would come with all those, that noise and so forth. But then, Jesus, you start healing here? You can imagine the, the, sh the shouts of excitement when a blind person receives sight or when a lame person was able to walk. Scott, when you talk about dancing in the church, you make some of us nervous. <laughs> <laughs> I'll go back with you later. Right <laughs> but, but the fact is, they were dancing and they were shouting. And then the kids joined in. You know, there was a, something happened this morning, and there was a child that called out the perfect time. Oh, shh, no, let the kids go. To, to know that. So, the religious leaders never were bothered by the noise of the money changers and all the things that the, these shysters were doing. But you get a little bit of ruckus going on from healings and children, we've got a problem. Jesus, we've got a problem. They had the wrong priorities. How many times do religious people have the wrong priorities? When I heard about this, the shooting this week, one of the first things that I began to pray for was the trans community. I want to be talking about that coming up in between Mother's Day and Father's Day. Please pray for me. I've been aching about that. I belong to an organization called Sexual Discipleship where they're trying to help churches navigate without just being judgmental all the time. We know what's wrong. I'm not going to change what's right and wrong, but how do we best respond? So one of the first things I began praying was for the trans community, that they're not attacked wrongfully. Because as a Baptist, I don't want to be attacked because what the, what's it, Westmore Baptist, what is that group that, that does all kinds of, there are a lot of Baptists that have done a lot of stupid things in the name of Jesus. I don't want to be associated with them. And I'm sure there's many trans people. They're hurting. They've been misled. They've been deceived by the enemy. And we, they need our prayers most of all. So what are our priorities? You know, and, and even in the news reporting, I'm sure you've heard this, people were more upset that they weren't using the proper pronoun for what that person wanted to be called than they were about the fact that they went into a Christian school and killed some people. There. You know, there. We just get our priorities messed up. Our sense of justice is always messed up. We need to ask the Lord to guide us. So religious people, religious leaders can have wrong priorities. They also are, they show rejection. That's their, their response is rejection. They're indignant. They, uh, these are the same religious leaders that a couple days from now 
will be egging on the crowd to shout, crucify him. Crucify him. They've rejected Jesus that much. In the Gospel of John, it says they're even looking to kill Lazarus because Lazarus was a walking testimony of the power of Jesus because he was risen from the dead, raised from the dead four days later. So they, they're just trying to wipe out all message that Jesus could be something special. So they reject him and they cause the crowd on, on Good Friday to reject him. And they walk in pride. You think about how you respond to children. Then check your pride. Because you were once one of those. You did a lot of dumb things when you were a child. We all need to just realize, because Jesus, when he was looking for an example, unless you accept me as a child. Let's talk about humility. Religious people are proud. We need to have humility. We need to respond to Jesus in humility because he knows so much more than we know. Wrong priority is rejection of pride. Here's the question. Do we humbly accept Jesus and his priorities? When he says no to something you really, really, really want, do you still trust him? Because he knows better about things than you ever will know. And he loves you, that wonderful song, way too much to give you lesser things. He has the blessings that he has for you, and you can trust him. Even when you don't understand, Jesus, I humbly accept you and what you're doing in my life. It's easy to say, remember that four-lane highway in my brain that goes to complaining first, complaining and anger. Then I calm down instead of reacting. I start to think about how should I respond to what's bothering me. The response of the disciples, the response of the prophets, the response of the crowd, the response of the religious leaders. We've been talking about other people. I have, to, I have to conclude with a focus on Christ. What do we learn in this story about Jesus? This Holy Week, I want to challenge you to learn more about Jesus. To make some plans to set aside special time in a unique way to learn more about Jesus. It's great if we have daily devotions. Sometimes we struggle just to maintain those. This week, do that and then add more to the time. It's a busy week. When I first saw the events of the week in the bulletin, I said, what are we doing? But every one of those things is an opportunity for you to learn more about Jesus. Monday night, ladies' Bible study, starting again. Tuesday, getting ready to transfer from one great teacher to another great teacher um, as they do that. So they're meeting again this week. Wednesday, guys, I'm not talking about the breakfast, but that's fun too. I'm talking about the Bible study that we can gather at. What about Wednesday night, prayer meeting? If we don't have a good Friday service in our church, we've never had, but I, maybe we'll do something about that sometime, but not this year. I did have in the bulletin, Jim already mentioned it. You'll be getting it on your, in an email, if you're on our email list. You'll be getting it, you just click on it and register for the Friends of Israel um, Passover service that they're going to lead on Good Friday evening at 7 p.m. Don't come here. We're not doing it here. It's online. You can click on that. Take the time. And last week when I mentioned the Daily Bread devotional, these all disappeared. There were still some in the back. There's still some. It's a 10-day devotional to focus your attention on Christ. If you didn't get one yet, pick one up. Find something that will help you focus on learning more about Jesus. It's so easy to consider what other people are doing and think, well, do I measure up? Don't worry about measuring. Find out who Jesus is. He helps you become more like him. And that's how we're going to learn and really come together on Easter to truly celebrate the power of his resurrection. So here are the things that I learned in this passage. Jesus has a plan. You may think he doesn't. He does. Jesus has a plan. Jesus offers peace. I feel so disrupted now, Lord. And the Holy Spirit, I've heard this, I love it. He comes to, to disrupt, uh, to disturb the comfortable and comfort the disturbed. That's the work of God in your life. But Jesus offers you peace through prayer and spending time with him. 
Jesus also demands holiness. Why did he drive them out? Because the holy sanctuary, the temple, was being defiled. His house of prayer. Now think with me for a moment. A couple weeks ago, Matthew rode a skateboard down the aisle. And we had just got done singing, Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary. This is a wonderful building. We want to treat it well. We don't want to disrespect it. But we're not, this isn't the sanctuary. We are the sanctuary. So when Jesus says, my house will be a house of prayer, look at yourself. How much do you feel put in your life that's not about prayer, not, not glorifying to God? He demands holiness. He also brings healing. I, I've had to tell a few people, just in conversation, I didn't mean to, I just mentioned the shooting and they hadn't heard yet. And I, I just wanted to, I didn't want to be the bearer of bad news, but that I mentioned it, so what are you talking about? And as I began to tell them. Um, so Jesus uh, brings healing. He offers us the healing. And then Jesus is the Son of God to be worshipped and served. Don't ever lose that picture of the awesome Son of God. And if you don't, well, the pictures I have in my mind are from his days on earth. Go read Revelation a little bit <laughs> and see how awesome he looks in there. And know, know that he is the Son of God to be worshipped and to serve. Now we're going to prepare for communion after I pray. And we're going to sing a familiar hymn, but it's not going to open up our hymn book. We are going to sing When I Survey. We're going to sing verses 1 and 3. They'll be on the slides. You can see which verses we intend to sing. And, and I'll, I'll explain it now because I'll probably forget to explain it later. After the, sir, after the communion time, we will sing two more verses. And I, and I just want to share one time when we were down in North Carolina visiting um, mom and dad. We, we, a couple of times, we went to the, the Billy Graham Library, if you've ever been there. It's a beautiful place. A little garden area, and I remember being alone, just kind of walking around, taking it all in. And there was somebody singing this version when I say, survey the wondrous cross. And as I was listening, when she finished the song, she repeated a line on that last verse, demands my soul. Demands my soul. Demands my soul. The Lord just met me there. Not because it was Billy Graham's library, but because the Lord was there. And the thought of what God is asking of us, asking of me. He doesn't ask anything of me that he's not going to prepare me for. He will, he will enable me. So when we sing after the communion service, you'll see that line. Don't get tripped up by it. The very last slide, you'll know it. You'll see it. Demands my soul. Demands my soul. I don't know if we'll sing it well, but I just want to recreate that moment if I could. And then we'll, I'm going to also ask you to read the benediction with me. I pray a benediction over you every week when we close. This Let's bless one another. And you'll see the slide that we'll read there as well. So let's, uh, let me pray and we'll uh, get prepared to sing this song together. Father, I praise you. I praise you so much for your love and your care for the stories of Jesus so many ways that we have heard things over and over again. Let them never become old. Help us to see them in a fresh, new way. Lord, you don't change, but we have changed. So the first time we heard about Palm Sunday, it might have been one way, but now we've heard about it and we continue to hear about it. Even the events of this week, we know more about this last week of Christ than any other part of his life. Many, much of the Gospels is found in this last week of Christ. And of course, looking to the cross. Father, I pray that as we prepare ourselves for communion, that we would worship you, that we would know you're a God of grace, ready to forgive and make us worthy to participate in this service together. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Give you a chance to stand on the first two verses. Let's stand together as we sing.
most of this service has been focused on Palm Sunday, but it is great at the end of this service to focus on the cross. Our salvation comes in our faith in Jesus as the Son of God. As God's Son, he could offer the perfect sacrifice for sin, and next Sunday we will celebrate the power of the resurrection, showing he has power over sin and death. We are blessed with the good news of the gospel, and right now, in this communion time, we focus on that message so that we may be more prepared to share it anytime we have the opportunity this week. We remember we do not partake in an unworthy manner. This is a celebration for believers who have confessed their sin to the Lord. That's how you become worthy. Just trust Him. Let's bow in time of silent prayer, and I'll close that time in prayer, and we'll continue on in our service. We thank you, Jesus, for all that you did to make this moment possible, to draw us to yourself, to draw us to this Palm Sunday morning, to celebrate communion together. Bless us as we continue to worship you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. So we invite all those who've trusted Jesus as their Savior and confess their sins to, to join us in this time of remembrance by partaking of the bread and the cup. And remind you that they are simply symbols of the body and blood of Christ. Paul explains in 1 Corinthians 11 that he received from the Lord what he had also passed on to them. The Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it. Jim would you please pray for the bread. The throne of grace is waiting shall we join him there. Father, as we come before you, we want to give thanks for this day. We come humbly and then we come boldly. We want to say thank you. Thank you for calling us to be your children and allowing us to come into your kingdom and looking forward to eternity with you. We praise you now. We thank you. We look forward to the taking of this bread as a representative of the body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and what took place on the cross that day for each and every one. Again, we praise you, we thank you, and we love you because you first loved us. It's in Jesus' precious name that I pray these things. Amen. If anyone doesn't want the past bread, we do have the cups here. Raise your hand and we'll see that somebody gets that to you. Just give you that opportunity. Okay.
Jesus said, This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Eat ye all. Diane, would you please pray for the cup? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, again, we come before you now to thank you for your mercies and your grace. We thank you, Lord, for the way that we are starting today, leading to your sacrifice, the death and resurrection, which has cleansed us of our sins and restored us into relationship with you. Again, help us never to take, your, take that for granted, but continue to be able to thank you, praise you, honor you, Lord. But most importantly, we dedicate ourselves to be able to serve you and to do what you really have called us to do, to be your mirror into the world, to be the light and the salt in this world, as you really have called us to do, with the power of your spirit. We ask this in thy name. Amen. Amen. supper Jesus took the cup so this cup is the New Testament the new covenant in my blood do this as often as you drink it in reverence of me drink you all 
Well, as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we do proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's stand and sing two more verses of When I Survey. benediction to one another today. And now, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit,